Hello everyone, we are today here at the Tank Museum at Bovington and here is David Willey, the tank curator and we will talk a bit about interwar and World War II, British tank doctrine and tactics. So basically I read a bit up on it and what I realized the British had this concept of the infantry tank and the cruiser tank in organization and what was the idea behind this? So the British are learning their lessons from World War I. We had a plan in World War I called Plan 1919, and it was going to be a massive tank attack, but using newer types of tanks that were just coming into production in 1918, and they weren't ready in time. And of course, the war ends in November of 1918. But as part of that theory, they realized instead of using the traditional cavalry to go through a prepared position like a front line and exploit the gap that something like the slower, heavier tanks, tanks like the Mark V, might have made in a front line, you then have faster vehicles. And we were just coming in with a Whippet tank, and then we were going to have a tank called the Medium A and the Medium B. They would end up going through the gap made, exploiting going faster than the slower Mark V tanks. Now that theory that they had for 1919, they experimented with something called the mechanized force in the 1920s, in the late 1920s. And for the first time in Britain and pretty much the world, what we did was we got a medium tank. So that was a tank that was much faster than the traditional three miles an hour tanks of World War I that were there to lead the infantry on the attack. So they got a medium tank, they got scout vehicles, little track vehicles to go ahead to scout the ground. They had, for the first time, artillery that was being towed by tracked vehicles, radio communications between these vehicles, and infantry on trucks as well. So we have what we'd now call a mechanized force and they experimented in war games up on Salisbury Plain, a British training area. And the ideas that came out of that were that let's not only think of the tank as something to punch through a front line, but it can be something that we can exploit, go for communication points, actually do what we used to know the cavalry used to do, and cause mayhem behind the front line and bring things with us that traditionally came on horseback or carried by soldiers, the engineers, the artillery, let's make it all mobile. And that theory they're discovering or they're testing in the 20s and 30s, Britain, however, we come to the conclusion that actually having tanks to exploit the gap is great. We then call those cruiser tanks but for an infantry tank, we still think we need the idea of a heavily, thickly armoured tank can be slower to do that initial breakthrough. So a lot of the soldiers are still thinking like World War I, big trench systems. If we still need to break through in the first place, we're going to have trouble. So we need a tank, and they then call these infantry tanks because they're going to help the infantry on the attack to go forward across the barbed wire we sometimes called it in Britain the shelled area tank. So it, think of it like a First World War battlefield where the artillery fire is going. If we need to crush down that barbed wire, protected tank doesn't have to be fast. It needs to be supporting the infantry. Then we'll go forward that way. We start with the Matilda 1. Um, it was a stopgap measure. Matilda 2, a much better tank. That was the theory behind it. Let's go slow with the infantry. And once that gap's been made, that's when we let the cruiser tanks off. And again, we had a series of cruiser tanks being developed much faster, lighter armor, because their role was to exploit the gap, cause mayhem. Maybe you might bump into an enemy tank. That wasn't really what they were designed for. It's making the most of the gap that the infantry tanks have already made. So basically, you have a breakthrough force, and then you have an exploitation force. And the infantry tanks, would they be an armored division or would they be attached to an infantry division? So we change this as we go through. And one of the big issues that hits all the armies in World War II is the difference between theory and practice. So we start off by liking the idea 
of support or infantry tank brigades put the tanks and allocate them to infantry units. Um, whereas we're going to actually look at the main armoured division as the exploitation force. Now, as the war progresses, we try different formations and different ways to get the best from this. Um, the British attitude to the infantry tank, don't forget a number of our tanks, like a Churchill tank, is really an infantry tank. Um, we still go ahead with the idea of the infantry tank in its development. Actually, on the battlefield, how these vehicles are being used are very different. And there is a tendency, we all know today, where we judge certain vehicles because, as if we're playing top trumps, here's this vehicle against that vehicle. Actually, the design of this vehicle and that vehicle may have been very, very different, but we now sort of look at them just because they've got tracks and a gun on, we compare them to with each other when their roles were very, very different. The American Sherman, in essence, is designed as a cruiser tank for exploiting a gap. They never thought that the Sherman was going to be designed for taking on German tanks. Um, it, was, it wasn't, you know, that, that's why the Americans designed tank destroyers. In Britain, we thought our infantry tanks would just be doing that initial assault rather than then being the tanks. It would be the anti-tank gunners if German tanks did appear. And this classic position we're in now of after World War II, we see it as tank battles at the beginning of World War II. The chances of tanks bumping into each other both armies were very sort of, they didn't think this was going to be a major concern during the course of the war. So that development that goes on, so we still use our infantry tanks in Britain, we still have them supporting even as far as 1944-45, Churchill tanks are tended to be the tanks to support the infantry, the cruiser tanks such as American Shermans or British Cromwell tanks are there for exploitation and they do at certain times use those uh, in specifically those roles, but so often they end up having to do both roles, which is why by the end of the war we start coming together, certainly in Britain, of thinking of this phrase, the universal tank. And that's why we lead on to actually, let's put those combination of items together, because the chance of you having the right type of tank in the right place at the right time is pretty slim. So let's make a tank that can do most of these roles together and that's why in Britain we come up with the Centurion. And we see that as a combination of the cruiser, almost like an infantry, when you actually look at its firepower, its armour protection, greater than those early war infantry tanks. Um, and yet it's got a meteor engine in it to give it some speed, that it can cross ground, and if it does meet enemy armour, it's got firepower that can take on enemy tanks as well. So that's very interesting. To see this concept of both. So basically the Germans, similar with their machine gun, went for a general purpose tank, whereas the British developed those both. And, and probably the, the reason for that, I mean, it's just a speculation, that you had initially more resources, but you had cut back and Germany just needed everything, so went to put out all the money and went for a general purpose tank. That's very interesting to see. And on the battlefield, in tactics-wise, so basically, was there a change during World War II in terms of tactics that you actually made certain doctrines and adaptions to use the infantry tank differently, or was this more on the fly? Um, there, it, is, it does become doctrine, and that changes. It is, again, this idea of contact with the enemy changes everything. So the theory is one thing, and the adaptation of your equipment when you're in the circumstances. So the cruiser tanks, for example, they were often being manned by cavalry regiments. Early in the war in North Africa, there was a terrible tendency to use those cruiser tanks almost like a horse. Let's charge the enemy. And in North Africa, in a number of the early battles, we have terrible losses that were avoidable because there was this great desire, let's use our speed, let's advance on the enemy as quickly as possible. But the Germans very sensibly had laid out their anti-tank guns and the British tanks were getting destroyed that way. So that led to, there was arguments about the equipment, but also the tactical doctrine for using that equipment. So we learn that lesson, and then in the later desert battles, we are stopping ourselves, being tempted to, we may have caused the German front line some damage, but don't go sweeping down the hill and lose that advantage of a prepared position, 
of well-sighted anti-tank guns just because you almost feel like now's the time for the cavalry charge, let's clear the battlefield off because we've done damage already, maybe with artillery, air power. That feeling that they then had to learn, no, look at your equipment, look at its tactical capabilities, learn from the mistakes you've made already. And so again, in other areas, we get the American Sherman tank. We know it's 75 millimeter gun, very effective, high explosive, reasonable capacity armor piercing. But if we're facing later war German tanks, let's not find ourselves getting embarrassed by losing these tanks. So we put the 17 pounder gun on a Sherman and they tended to act in what you might now call an overwatch position. So tactically, for every troop of three or four Sherman tanks, you'd have a Sherman Firefly that would sit there as an overwatch position while your standard Sherman's advanced, then it would move forward on another bound. So again, you adapt your doctrine and your tactics as the equipment comes along. The danger, of course, is you write your doctrine, try and adapt the tanks to that doctrine, and the reality of combat may just not make that work. Um, there's some areas, you know, that, that, that we still learn. We are a teaching establishment here at the Tank Museum. One of the big things that they learned in World War II, if you are going to be using a combined armor and infantry on the attack, if you train with that infantry unit that you're going to fight with, you do much better in combat. And that lesson was really hard. We tend to forget it. And probably that training bond is better than the equipment issue. If these guys know what they're doing and they're experienced and they're trained, so all the time there is a tendency, we always talk here at the Tank Museum, we talk about the caliber of the gun, the thickness of the armor, all just rubbish if the men inside don't know how to use it, they're not trained well enough, they don't cooperate with their all arms around them, that is what's gonna give them victory, not just the quality of the material they're sitting in. That's exactly a very good point because I, I remember reading um, German Panzer commanders complaining about infantry support that they usually thought that the Panzer would do everything and they didn't know about their drawbacks and everything. And also Manstein, when he proposed the Sturmgeschütz, that it should be an organic unit of an infantry division and not an external one. And the very interesting point you said uh, that they later on didn't start to charge forward with the cruiser tank in the desert. Would this to a certain degree explain, because I, I know Montgomery was criticized very much after the Second Battle of Al Alamein, that he finished off Rommel's troops, the rest of the Africa Corps at this point. And this was basically probably um, um, based on that, that before they charged always in. And this time, said, okay, be cautious, we broke through the line, and let's be careful and not ride into another ambush. Is this around I, these I lines? I think so. I think there's, there's a number of issues there with Alamein. I think there can be criticisms of Montgomery that he did not exploit as best he can. There's a number of other things that if you're there in the desert, number one, you've had the fatigue of a major battle yeah. that affects everybody. Number two, the weather changes. That affects the landscape as well. Um, there's a number of things that come into play that it's easy for us to turn around and say, if only they'd done this, if only we'd pushed a little further, a bit quicker, we may well have had a greater victory. Those, those issues that fireside generals, as we all are now, that we can criticise, um, they do come into play and we do have to be careful without seeing a bigger picture or the diaries or the accounts of people on the day because, again, this sense of we don't want to overexpose ourselves. We are traditionally, we've been a very nervous force in the Eighth Army because so often we thought we've had the victory and suddenly the bite backs come and we've suddenly found ourselves retreating again. So one of the issues that Montgomery does to the Eighth Army where he's put in charge is he gives solidity, he gives a sense of leadership, of determination, we're not going for any further back, but part of that is this calm, clear way he is going to be directing the battle. So the sense of, yes, we might miss a fleeting opportunity, but all the commanders know this is the key elements are we're not going to lose men for no good reason. If we are going to be attacking, we're going to be attacking with a formed plan. Um, we know what we're going to be doing and there's a clarity and a confidence in all the issues. So some of these things may come into play which stops that exploitation. If I'm honest, 
we had been earlier being able to exploit. Look at O'Connor's victory earlier in 1940 where he completely trounces a massive Italian army and exploits opportunities one after the other to great effect. So it's not that the British Army can't do this, um, but you can see at different times there's perhaps that idea. And what we certainly didn't want to do, you know, there's a whole host of other issues we tend to forget about, logistical. Yeah. You know, we, we, we lose tanks all over the place. The Americans, luckily, we managed to get a whole load of Sherman tanks available just before the Alamein battle. You know, they strip the 1st American Armoured Division that's training out in the desert to get them onto a boat to get across. So there's other factors coming into play all the time that, again, sometimes, you know, I'd never say it's going to be one decision that makes that person do something at a certain time, but certainly with Alamein, that idea about we don't want to be too over nervous, we don't want to extend ourselves, and if we're going to do this, and Montgomery is famous for it, he wants a nice tidy battlefield. Let's end up making sure we do it stage by stage by stage. Great, you know, and when he does have a risk, like at something like uh, Market Garden, he burns his fingers. So you can almost see how he feels his success is coming by a well fought and well staged battle rather than taking gambles and risks. Rommel is prepared to take those gambles and risks. Because he has also no other chance, basically, because he's playing against the time and the strategic so advantage was. Played to his strengths Montgomery. as yeah. well. Yeah, yeah, so that's so another thing he's going to be doing. So. Uh, thank you very much. No problem. A big thank you to the Tank Museum and especially David Willey here. Be sure to subscribe to the YouTube channel and check out the videos on specific tanks or on specific events. Thank you for watching and see you next time.